Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Described as a womanizer and an authoritarian but incompetent ruler, one who controlled dissent by arresting journalists and not content being president, Napoleon III, <laughs> well, you didn't know where I was going with that? <laughs> Napoleon III then declared himself emperor based on what he called his universal popularity. Uh, that's the end of that, but not really, because Napoleon III, uh, his rule ended in, during the childhood of Debussy. And uh, there was the Franco-Prussian War, and I know this isn't news. <laughs> it sounds like it, but no. Um, it was Franco-Prussian War, and the French lost. And in Paris, uh, the, the French did not want to um, agree to the terms of surrender, so there was a lot of chaos. And then what formed was called the Paris Commune, which was a, a socialist, sometimes called anarchist, it depends who you ask, a socialist, somewhat radical for the time, group that uh, had as it, one of its captains Debussy's father. Uh, Debussy's father was trained in nothing. Uh, he, was, he, he, he tried, he made a living scraping by doing many things. He had a china shop for a while. Uh, he was a salesman for a while. But he became an anarchist. And that's an important thing when you think of what happens with Debussy who was actually called a musical anarchist in the press by people who had no idea who his father was. And, and there is a similarity of personality here. But anyway, his father then was arrested when the French army crushed the, um, the commune. And he was originally given four years in prison, which was when Debussy was nine. But after a year in prison, they commuted his sentence and made him free, but with no civil rights. Okay. I just thought I'd throw that in there. It's very interesting. Um, now, Debussy, though, uh, I should say, though, one more thing about the commune. Their radical ideas that ca caused so much turmoil consisted primarily of women getting the vote and separation of church and state. Uh, the separation of church and state did come in Debussy's lifetime in 1905, which was the same year that uh, Faure was given uh, the job of being head of the conservatoire. And it was a very political decision to give him that because he was not a political person. And most of even the arts and music, they were all politicized. And Debussy went from one extreme to another. He was uh, considered a musical anarchist because in some ways he was. He broke down the rules of harmony. He ignored the grammar and syntax of conventional music. He restructured how this was done. So taking apart the structure and reorganizing it for his own purposes is pretty anarchistic. Uh, but by time he became a very established, important French composer who was the, um, I mean, he was called the Verlaine of music, which actually now calling Verlaine the Debussy of music would probably sound better. But he, at that point, he started to move into a nationalist viewpoint and became a right wing kind of person. Um, in the end, though, uh, he was mostly just Debussy. And there was um, a, the Debussyists, who were young composers like Ravel, who were obsessed with Debussy. And the, the group I mentioned when we did Ravel, Les, Les Epaches, who were like the hooligans who just went crazy for Debussy. And when his opera Peleas was performed uh, for the, when it was premiered in Paris, the, the group called Les Epaches took over the entire top balcony. And they went to 30 performances so that they could scream how great it was every single time. Um, and people who missed the performance were banished from Les Epaches. Pretty serious stuff. Um, but the anarchist thing is, is quite big. And I, I'm going to spend a moment, before we even hear any music, just going over some of the anarchic concepts that uh, are now accepted as part of Debussy's uh, world. So pardon me, Michael. <clears throat> uh, just a few things. So the world that Debussy inherited consisted of major and minor, primarily. Major. I know, it's natural minor. Wow, those are glittering. Okay. <laughs> Harmonic minor. And that was basically, that was the world 
that of harmony. There were, er, people knew about the other modes. At the Scola Cantorum, they knew, which was uh, not the conservatoire, it was the other one, where they had a, you had to learn about how music was Catholic first and you had to learn the modes of the Catholic Church. So they knew about Mixolydian. And they knew about Lydian. That's the, that's the Krupke mode. And the, uh, see? Everyone knows that. And the, um, the Phrygian mode. And the fictitious mode, which only was talked about in the Middle Ages theoretically, but no one used it, the Locrian mode. Recognize that from this piece? Good, they do. <laughs> I know, they play it a lot. The Locrian mode is a mode that um, you can think of it as starting on the leading tone of a scale. <laughs> it goes back there. So nobody used that mode. Um, at the conservatoire, you could only use major and minor. All the other modes were banned. It's true. Um, at the Scola Cantorum, you could use them under certain religious purposes, which were, these modes were extremely vetted in order to be used. Some of them were never used, like that one, until Debussy got hold of it. So Debussy, first of all, allowed all the modes to cohabitate in his music, and also other modes. The whole tone scale, which we've talked about, just whole tones, which is only six notes, and the octatonic, Uh, and harmonically, and this is really, all these modes is one thing, but harmonically the biggest revolution was that he got rid of the concept of function. Function is like grammar. So harmonic um, function means, for example, this chord resolves like this. Perfect timing. <laughs> you want to stand up again? Okay, now you could also think of it this way. This was another function that was permitted. Okay, but what about doing this, Debussy thought? That has no explanation. What about this? Do it twice, it's even better. Three times, and go on. That's one of the things he, he realized, that if you do something strange twice or three times, then people get used to it, and then you move on to another one. So there's a lot of strange, small repetitions in Debussy for that reason. Um, it's the old thing, you know. Say something more than once, say it twice, people believe it. It's the same in music. So here you go. So by parallel harmony, by non-grammatical, non-functioning harmony, plus the use of all the modes, we get a new world, and that world was considered anarchic. In fact, here's a, a, a review of Debussy's that uses that word. His music is anarchy, disorder, confusion. Chance seems to direct all movement. The notes merely repel and detest each other. <laughs> Debussy wrote a play. Did you know that? Say yes. Yeah. What a great audience. <laughs> uh, Debussy wrote a play uh, he co-authored it with a guy whose name I can never remember, Rene Peter. Uh, the play is called The Brothers of Art, and it's really hard to find. But what it's about is a few painters, because he was trying to disguise that it was him. <laughs> so a few painters who get together and change all the rules of painting and then convince the public that um, you have to break down bourgeois society and allow for everything to be personal. So that was the play. It never went anywhere as a play, but that's exactly what he, what he did as a, uh, as a composer. Now, let's go through the piece. Here we go. So I'm going to ask them to play. Let's do that first big opening phrase that goes up until the piano.
Okay, now I'm going to discuss that for 25 minutes. <coughs> okay, here, let me. <coughs> so basically, we have a G minor chord. So even though this is late in Debussy's life, in fact, this is the last piece he wrote. Because he had cancer, he died at 55. While he was dying in the hospital, the Germans were bombarding Paris. So the last thing he heard were explosions destroying Paris while he was dying. It was terrible, I'm sure. Anyway, so this, this chord, you expect perhaps this chord because it's minor. So by, by his writing this chord, we already feel that it's some kind of mode. It's not major, it's not minor because the first chord is minor and the fourth chord in structural harmony is going to be minor. But since it's major, you don't even, you just feel that something odd might be happening. But also the rhythm. We have no sense of pulse. And then when the violin comes in, the pulse is still. But then the amazing thing is this. Now this chord doesn't exist in that mode either. This is when we know it's got to be Debussy at this point. Because you have the strange mode. You're not sure quite what it is. It's probably Dorian mode if you're one of those, uh, if you studied at the Schola Cantorum and you're writing down the modes as you listen. But this chord has in it two notes that are disturbing. First, we already have, we have all these E naturals. And then an E flat, but also a G flat. So G, this chord is an E flat minor chord. It's just, the amazing thing about it is the chord does not fit in the mode and in, it doesn't fit in any version of that mode because it's a G mode and there's a G flat. So we're already out of the mode and it doesn't have any function either. So it has no modal reference, it has no harmonic function, but its point is to be disturbing. Now as modern listeners, we, ex we, we have no problem with that. It's an emotional moment. It's a strange, disturbing moment. So of course, the chord is disturbing. It could be much more disturbing and we'd accept it and wait to see what happens. But that was a different time. So that chord was quite weird. Now, Debussy though, even though he was somewhat of an anarchist, he is going to keep in mind these two notes and he's going to make a lot out of that, just like Beethoven would, even though he despised Beethoven. He despised Beethoven originally because he represented uh, the German hegemony in, in music that the French were trying to get rid of. Then he, he also despised the idea that music had to follow logic and unfold and tell a story as a narrative. He was against all of that. What he wanted music to do was be more in the moment, like perfume, like uh, a sensory um, sonic event, not that it had to develop and turn into something. Ironically, he went back to that a little bit. So this is in sonata form, but only in a very French sonata form. And he did it on purpose, saying many times that we will take back the intellectual forms from the German and fill them with French content. So he, this is when he was becoming very nationalistic. OK, so we have that weird chord. Now, the note that was totally shocking is this G flat. But in the next bar, makes it an F sharp as part of a new chord. Now, I'm going to keep saying this till you're just amazed. <laughs> because th if this starts to feel some like something, then the whole piece will make sense. In other words, this strange G flat is redefined over here. And this chord has an E natural. So the E flat goes back to an E natural, but the G flat becomes an F sharp. And what that feels like is new lighting. It's like seeing you have this chord that's disturbing, and light shines on it, and it reflects in a whole new way, and it has a whole new meaning. It's like when you have an optical illusion, and you can't see something, and then it changes into something else. That's what enharmonic, uh, that's the word for it, uh, enharmonic spelling in, in music. That's the feeling of enharmonic writing, which is a note takes on a new meaning because of the context, and you suddenly feel it differently. So this G flat becomes, which does let us resolve here, and then the E natural comes back. Now, I'm going to ask you guys to play from the beginning through to that F sharp. 
Did I just turn the page? No. Okay. That F sharp. Now, let me just say one thing about that. That F G flat that became an F sharp becomes obsessively a, a point of reference throughout the piece. We're going to stop right on an F sharp in the violin that's all by itself. And Debussy keeps coming back to that F sharp and leaves it all alone in silence. Well, everything around it is silent. And then he keeps redefining it, and it actually will de help determine even this huge middle section, what key we go to. All right, so let's go up to there. That is by itself, that F sharp. We stop there so that you will not forget that F sharp. The decision to uh, play it slightly bluesy, um, is that something you guys discussed? I think it works, but is that something you discussed a lot or you've, you've heard other people do it that way or you can't help it or what is it? Neither. It's just something that you feel like doing. Yeah, right, right. That's a very good reason. Okay, now, uh, I'm just going to use your score because it doesn't have all that ridiculous analysis on one word. Uh, actually, I want to get something here. I want to normalize this music so that you hear what he's not doing. Uh, but before I, I do that, I, there's some composers that inspired him, and they were Russian composers, because when Debussy was very young, uh, a young man, he encountered Nadezhda von Meck, who was the... Um, benefactor of Tchaikovsky, and she took Debussy with her to teach, uh, to teach music and, uh, in Russia. And he lived in Russia for a while, taking care of some kids and being their piano teacher and their music teacher. While he was there, he heard a lot of Russian music, because that was the only way to hear Russian music is, you know, at that point. And he wrote a lot about it. For example, he said about Mussorgsky, Mussorgsky conveys shadowy sensations of trembling anxiety which move and wring the heart. So he liked it. And um, <laughs> here are two examples of piano pieces. They're not by Mussorgsky, but by their, they're by the Russian Balakirev that Debussy would have found quite compelling. And you'll see these sound very simple compared to Debussy, but there are little things in there that point towards the Debussy world. <laughs> here, for example, the uh, chord here, that enters on a ninth. Now, remember, I'm going to review this quickly, that we have, a, if we go in thirds, a root, a third, a fifth, a seventh, a ninth, eleventh, a thirteenth, okay? And those, those, that expansion of harmony from one, three, five, which is your triad, to one, three, five, seven, which is a a seventh chord to one three five seven ninth chord one three five seven nine eleven and thirteen all of that by after that there's nothing left because you're back where you started having that huge expanse allows like we saw in the Ravel all kinds of interesting um, transpositions and modulations and references to happen because there's more to play with instead of having a small structure you have this big structure so you can take the bottom out and put another one in amazing things can happen so here's another example of that kind of thing by Balakirev sounds like early Debussy. It's just a seventh chord going to a ninth and not resolving. See, if I did this, or if he did this, then it wouldn't do it. It stays in the mist. And that's it. And because it doesn't resolve, it does eventually. 
But it, because it doesn't resolve right away, it's like Debussy. And he heard that kind of stuff, and it really mattered to him to, to explore um, what they left hanging it turned into a whole new world. And of course, they did not get rid of functioning harmony. They just let things not resolve as much. Um, Mussorgsky sometimes did get rid of functioning harmony, but never for as long and as meticulously and, and continuously as Debussy. So if we take this opening that you just heard by Debussy, and I normalize it into a kind of Balakirev or standard rhythm and standard harmony, it would sound more like this. Exactly all the same notes, right? Okay, good. So that's what he doesn't do. He, they, what that pointed out is not just that he got away from the functioning harmony, but the rhythm is just floating and suspended, and there are rests, and you don't know where it is. There, almost everybody else before Debussy, probably everybody really, would have a pulse that you feel, and Debussy, even in this late work where there's more pulse, he let the pulse of the music also kind of disappear into mist, just as he did the harmony. Okay, now let's start right where you stopped and go, let's see, go quite a bit. Let's go up to Listesso Tempo, which is two. Uh, from the F sharp, yeah. Okay, now we have a lot of great stuff there. Um, Michael, just can you just play after half sharp that first chord that you play? Okay, think if you know what that is. And I'll tell you and you can correct yourself or pat yourself on the back. It's a whole tone, a bunch of whole tones. Play that again. Do you want to fill in all the whole tones for us? Yeah. Now the next chord that you play is... Yeah, and there, so whole tones are very close to being dominant ninths. I mean, it, there only are, you know, 11 uh, intervals and 12 pitches so by, on the keyboard. So by moving a little bit, amazing things can happen. So a dominant ninth, if you move one note, you have a whole tone scale. Don't think that this isn't fun for a composer. You know, you've got whole tone scales, you play one, you move one note, you get a dominant ninth, you move another, you get an, uh, into an octatonicism. So that's what he's doing back and forth here. Uh, then, as another example of his playing with the modes, let's start right at one. Let me just, uh, just the violin for a moment. Okay, great. And so she's only playing the same, really, the, over and over, pretty much. And that, one, two, three, four notes, if you add an A, which the tune does, you want to play that little? That adds an A. That is a pentatonic mode. The pentatonic mode is a five note mode, hence the name pentatonic. I don't know which came first. No, I'm kidding. Uh, uh, but um, the pentatonic mode is given its due. And then she continues to play that. And while she plays it, little chromatic notes, alterations come in, and the harmonies get richer. And then they come in with ninth. So let's hear that passage with that in mind, that it starts pentatonic. Then it becomes major and minor chords, and then richer ninth chords. He's just adding the layers on top of pentatonic at one. Pentatonic. Now ninth chords.
Okay, now, you just heard, pardon me, you just heard, uh, you just heard, and then, so again, it's the F and the F sharp. It's that F sharp. The, uh, the only reason for this chord, which has nothing to do with where we are, and then is the F, F sharp back and forth. Um, now, Michael, if you, wouldn't, if, if you wouldn't mind, right before two, one, two, three, four bars, just, let's just hear the piano part there. Okay, now that, play that a slower and, and just listen to it. each chord is the same, moving down a scale. In other words, this is an example of parallel harmony. Those, each chord is a dominant seventh chord. Now, I, I'm going to repeat one of my favorite descriptions of what parallel harmony is. So if you know it, good. And if you don't, I think this really does describe it. Let's say that functioning harmony is like an apartment. In, in, a, in an apartment, and I mean, it has to be an apartment, not a house. Uh, in an apartment, um, each room has a function. And we know what the function is. A kitchen, we know what it's for. There's a bedroom, there's a bathroom, there's a living room, there's maybe a library, a dining room, whatever. They all have names and they have functions. You tend not to cook in the bedroom, for example. I mean, it makes sense. But let's say now you have an apartment on a particular floor and underneath it, all the apartments have the exact same layout. If you had to cut a hole from the top floor to the bottom and slid down a fireman's pole and just did kitchen, 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 that's parallel harmony because you're hearing the, the kitchen chord here, let me, let me just demonstrate that. So you're, you're in C major, and you've got different rooms of the house. Every chord is a different room. This is the kitchen. <laughs> now, if you slide down, you're going through lots of different keys. You're in other people's apartments. And it's all the exact same structure. Now, if you ever get stuck playing cocktail piano, <clears throat> you can just do that all day. It allows you to speak while you're playing. <laughs> just use dominant ninth chords all day long. And if you, if you just do this to a dominant ninth chord, it sounds like music. People say, hey, is that Debussy? <laughs> okay, so those were dominant ninth chords. Michael, you should practice that in case you're out of work one day. <laughs> um, now, let's find three spots. In, uh, we're going to look at all, we're going to hear all three movements today, because uh, the piece is not huge. Let's find another pa great parallel harmony spot in the second movement for Michael to play. Um, okay, good timing. Oh, well, what about just the da -ka -ta 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 -ta? Yeah, right there. Yeah, just, yeah, it's going up. What's interesting is that there, not every note is moving on top. There's an F. Can you play the F stuck on top there? For a while, the F is stuck, but the chords underneath it are parallel. Okay, now let's pick in the third movement a nice parallel harmony moment. Oh, uh, after one, yeah, you got it. Yeah, the last three bars were not parallel harmony, but everything else was. Can you just play them without the diddly diddlies, just the chords? And now let's do that with violin, starting at that spot, because the, all of this long stretch of music is just parallel dominant seventh chords. And the, ninth are, the ninths are often in the violin. So that you get a dominant seventh chord in the piano and a ninth in the violin, and they travel together. And yes, there are a couple of other notes that are passing by, which happens. You go in the kitchen, there's someone you didn't expect. <laughs> you know, and we got a new blender. <clears throat> All right, 
Okay, yeah, oh, okay. <laughs> and then, and then uh, would you play, uh, yeah, play that for us. Yeah, now how about playing that uh, quietly and slowly so we can hear it. Parallel harmony. And this, play this other moment from the same thing here. Okay, now this, uh, let's see, what is this piece? Can you play that the way it goes? Yeah, and, and, and the next section too, listen carefully. Right, okay. Um, is this a coincidence? This is not a coincidence. American in Paris is autobiographical. It's George Gershwin went to Paris, and what did he do in Paris? He collected mostly the music of Debussy. He came home with a huge stack of Debussy's pieces. Debussy was dead, of course, but, but um, the music was there. And he was also interested in, in other people, but the, the, what affected his music more than any other composer was Debussy. And the parallel ninth chords that you just heard um, in Debussy are exactly the same in Gershwin. In fact, I, I have, I, I don't know if we'll get to this, it's not important, but I, I took Debussy and Gershwin passages and just alternated them, and it just sounds like a piece. They're totally fine, in case we ever need that. Okay, <laughs> now let's get back to the first movement. Uh, <clears throat> okay, he, there is a, a development section in this piece, and, uh, but it's not a development like a German development. So if you're expecting motifs to turn into something else and into, uh, to grow and then be challenged by some harmonic or chromatic dragon and then they slay it and then they win and it's all, I mean, I'm, I'm being silly, but basically the narrative of the struggle and the triumph, which is great in Beethoven, is not interesting to Debussy. He's totally against the struggle and the triumph. What he's interested in is mood shifts, color, sonority, maybe a new thing appears, and we don't know why, but there's a reason. Now, one of the great things in this, uh, his very last piece, uh, and it's the last piece he played, too, let alone wrote, um, is that there is this amazing key change, but even though Debussy liked to do things for no reason, he never actually did, and is, that's either because we are, human beings are great at finding explanations for things even when they're not there. That's a possibility, but that's still an explanation. Or, <laughs> or um, if you're using tonal harmony and the harmony that comes out of this tradition of function, no matter how far you get from it, there's resonance of this stuff and there are things in his ear. His, he had a great ear. Now, don't forget, Debussy was highly trained as a musician. He, you know, this is an amazing story um, because, it, you know, his father was arrested. He didn't, he was, his mother whisked him away from Paris to Cannes or Cannes, depending on uh, which pronunciation you use. And there he had his father's sister, Clementine, who introduced him to a woman who claimed to have studied with Chopin, who she may well have, and she gave him some piano lessons. Then his father and mother took him back. And because he could play the piano so well, so quickly, they got him a, a serious piano teacher in Paris. And by 10 years old, he was in the conservatory with no, nothing but these two piano teachers. He got into the conservatory. He never had any other schooling. And he didn't like the schooling there because he was such a different kind of person from everybody else. They, he was both, he was described by the kids there who were all from bourgeois families, but he was not. He was described as both, uh, Gauche, or they called him gaucherie, you know, that he was an example of something really um, beneath them. At the same time as he had this weird aristocratic air, uh, air, and they said that he seemed above everyone but also beneath them. The, the, this was a strange phenomenon. So his teachers got used to the fact that he was extremely talented, but whenever they told him how to do something, he would say, why? <laughs> and they didn't really have good answers other than, well, that's the history, that's how it's done, this is how the great composer, but, but why do I have to do it that way? because you're in the conservatory. It's not a great answer. <laughs> okay, so he changed everything. And the most famous conversation he ever had was with Giro, who was a, a very good teacher, who had an open mind, 
Um, and Debussy played some of his music for him, and the, this is highly documented and written about. Giro said, well, that's quite beautiful, but there's no theoretical explanation for it. And Debussy famously said, but the only thing I care about is the sound, the, the pleasure of it. And he said, pleasure is the law. That's the famous line, pleasure is the law. And this teacher you know, understood that, but he didn't let him do it in class, but he understood it. Um, OK, so therefore, even with this strange key we're about to hear, there is actually a very clear setup for this key. So let's, let's go to uh, number two and then get into this E major section. And let's play up to number three, so from two to three. So this beautiful E major section has a couple of things happening in it. Um, but for one thing, remember how it started with this E flat minor chord, and this F sharp then was redefined, and then the F sharp is left alone. Well, the F sharp and the other note that was new, these two notes can lead us as enharmonic notes. They can become D sharp and F sharp instead of G flat and E flat. And he keeps playing with that back and forth, G flat, F sharp. And then the key signature of E major has both of those. It has D sharp and F sharp and C sharp and G sharp. So in other words, the F sharp, which keeps coming back, now becomes the beginning of this melody. Instead of being this or this, it's this. F sharp. Now, that's one thing. So the E major makes the F sharp a ninth. And remember, ninth, that's his favorite note, is the ninth of something. So I'm going to review, but then push it a little further. So the, the G flat comes in, it's a weird note. He redefines it as an F sharp. He keeps leaving these F sharps hanging in midair. Then he has chords about the, that appear, out of like B minor chords, that appear to highlight the F sharp. Then the F sharp begins a melody as a ninth of E major, and that it takes on a whole new glowing meaning. And then he does something incredible. So we have this. By the way, this tune, if you take away the chords, it doesn't sound like it's in a major key, because it sounds modal. It's hard even to tell what it is. Because it doesn't have a B. It doesn't have all of the notes. It has one, two, three, four, and six, and seven. There's no, there's no fifth. Now, the piano has it all over the place. But the tune is restricted by have, not having an important note, which helps define the tune. And also, and this is a very esoteric little thing. That's why I love these things. But it's restricted to a sixth a small range. Historically, Gregorian chant was restricted to that exact range. So he knows all about Gregorian chant. The first music Debussy heard was as a choir boy in a little church, and that's what got him started. And so he sang a lot of Gregorian music. And some people think that he grew up first hearing Gregorian music, and when he first heard through piano lessons classical Western music uh, that wasn't Gregorian, he was in shock. And he kept that shock because he didn't know, he hadn't known anything else. He had no recordings. He didn't have an iPhone. He didn't have anything. So it was a shock. Now, the most amazing thing in this first movement is that that F sharp 
comes back, let's start right at three. Listen to the fact that her tune is the same melody starting on the same F sharp, but something is changed. Okay, now, this is, this is really defines Debussy, and this is, at the time, an incredibly modern, unique, personal concept. Um, and this change, this, this, what you're about to hear, this influenced every composer after him, including Stravinsky and Prokofiev and Bartok, which is, he takes this E major chord, going back to the other one, F sharp. Then we get a C major chord next. Starts on the same F sharp, though. But all the sharps are missing. Some of the notes are the same and some are different. He didn't change key. He changed the mode around the F sharp. This is actually a revolutionary thought. Nobody had done this. Now, he had done it in other pieces, but, so it's not the first time he did it. But it's a completely unique thought, which is very common in music now. Jazz players do it, everybody does it, but it came out of Debussy's completely personal vocabulary. So again, I'm gonna to try to explain this one more time. We're in E major. He takes the tune. Then it comes back, but instead of, it's, it's got a C major key signature except for that F sharp. So this is in the Lydian mode. I should tell you, all the notes have the same names, just they don't have the same number of sharps. So in other words, F sharp E, F sharp G natural, F sharp A was before F sharp E, F sharp G sharp. It was, it's just there were sharps, and they're gone. And instead of E major, so that this is sitting on top of E major, it is now surrounded by C major, starting on that same F sharp. So what is the development here? The development is that first weird note the G flat from the very first phrase, which is immediately redefined as an F sharp, comes back as an F sharp in E major, as a nine, and then it comes back as a Lydian F sharp, and it's the note that makes it Lydian. Uh, in other words, if I make it F natural, it's C major, but the F sharp, it's that mode again. OK, um, it is. That's the mode. The, that F sharp is what he develops by leaving it there and changing everything around it. This is completely new in music. He, he, it's basically a one note development. It's incredible. Aren't you amazed? I'm amazed. I was, it suddenly hit me. I went. <laughs> OK, then <clears throat> there are more things we can say about this. but. Uh, the, let's take a look at the end of the first movement. How about starting right at G? We'll play from G and stop right. I want to show you where to stop because then stop right there. Uh, yeah. Six. Yeah, right, right. Don't play this. Okay? okay? All right. <clears throat> Okay, we don't know what's going to happen next, but <clears throat> what, what you've got there, <clears throat> I'm just going to put this here for a second. What you've got there is a, a mode that doesn't seem to be full. Again, there are notes missing. It feels Phrygian, and then it starts to be pentatonic. It doesn't matter that, I mean, it, I'm just saying that they're restricted modes. They're not major or minor. This is pentatonic. What we don't have is an E or a B. We have no E's and we have no B's. So it's hard to tell what's going on in terms of any of the modes because we're missing two notes. Then 
we get, okay, you have to play this. <laughs> Go back and do that again and let's, you're going to hear a giant C major chord. That C major chord gives us the E we want to hear, but also, if you think back, can you just play the opening for us again? Think back, you hear that in your mind? <laughs> there, that's the C major chord. So the C major chord that made us suspicious of the tonality comes crashing back in to define it at the end. And then there's one more weird thing he does, but we'll just hear it first and then. And then go on. Yeah, let's go from six to the end. Now let me just go back to make this clear. First, when it, with the first phrase, we do have a B flat. Then it's gone, and we, and we have no E. You know, it's not a matter that you follow every little thing, but in other words, first there's a restricted mode, then he removes the B flat, and we have an even more restricted mode. It's not even wholly pentatonic, it's just four notes. The C major chord crashes in, giving us the E natural, and we feel, ah, you know, we've got tonality, we've got some, something, to, a mode we can hang on to. But the scale, is, what is the scale? It's Locrian. Locrian is the forbidden, fictitious scale that no one uses. I'm not kidding you. Locrian, in other words, in the Middle Ages, they wrote about uh, various scales and they gave them names from the Greek, uh, they gave them Greek names, thinking that they were talking about the Renaissance of Greek thought. They were completely wrong. But, uh, that didn't matter. Uh, they gave them Greek names, Dorian, Phrygian, Mixolydian, Lydian, Aeolian, Locrian. All of those modes were assigned church mode qualities, which then made their way into secular music. But the Locrian mode did not. The Locrian mode was purely theoretical because nobody wanted to write in it. And I'll, I'll show you why. Um, here's the Locrian mode. First of all, you can't. Uh, I mean, it is, it's to our ears, it sounds quite lovely and beautiful, but there's no fifth. In other words, that's a problem for them. And, and if, if you restrict Gregorian chant to a little six, like I was talking about when Debussy does it, this was considered a big problem because this interval in the Middle Ages was considered the Diabolus in Musica. This was the devil. It's another lecture, <laughs> but let me say that that's the interval that gives us tonality. That's the interval that makes it possible to have dissonance and harmony, and it's like that, that's a very important interval. So it was banned for a while. Actually, back to being banned, it was banned. Okay, so here, Debussy gives us this Locrian mode. As, I mean, it's, it is almost sarcastic. He, he's done everything he can, and then the last gesture is to take the Locrian mode that nobody uses and write a huge scale based on it, and then the last few chords attempt to normalize it into G minor. And they do, viciously. Let's just hear the, from the C major chord to the end. The chords get rid of the Locrian mode, obviously. Right. Okay, now I think we're going to hear all three movements. Just thinking if there's something, there's many other things to say, but. Ah, I think that was pretty good. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I think that's enough. So, <clears throat> um, Don B and Michael are going to play the in all three movements. Uh, I think the whole thing is about 12 or 13, 12 minutes. So it's uh, the, the length of one. Uh, classical, like Brahms or Mozart movement that we usually do.
So next week, all of a sudden, it's Mozart. But I want to remind you that Ravel, when asked what his style was and how he taught, he said, everything's Mozart. <laughs> so I'll see you next time. <laughs>